Welcome on into Conversations. I'm your host, Drew Patrick, and today I am very happy to be joined by Dr. Kristen Long, uh, Assistant Professor of Biology here at Mansfield University. Thank you so much for taking the time and stopping by. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So I, I want to start with kind of a background o- on you and just for, for your interests in science and what was it? Did, it? did it start as a kid or did it come on late? What was it about science that, that really got you interested? Hmm, that's a tough question. I've always liked science for as long as I can remember, but thinking back to my childhood, I would always go around collecting different things in nature and adding it into vinegar or adding it into oil and seeing what happened to that. So I would take different types of flowers and pull off the petals and add them into these weird household things and then see how they changed as a result of that. So I remember doing that from a young age, but in terms of the research side of it, that didn't really happen until my sophomore year of high school. I always thought I wanted to be a vet, and I would shadow vets during my younger years. But the sophomore year in high school, I read a book called The Hot Zone by Richard Preston, and it was assigned to me by my biology teacher. And I absolutely fell in love with that aspect of it. It's about Ebola, which is a hemorrhagic virus. It's an absolutely terrifying virus. It's extremely deadly. But just learning about the ins and out of the virus and the epidemiology side of it really piqued my interest from more of a research side compared to my what I thought I was going to be with the veterinarian side of it. And and how did that that then change happen? So like um, you you had had this plan and then was it just this is interesting I want to know more about it or was it a uh, a, a wow moment, I guess. Is the- yeah, it was a wow. There's this whole other world that's related to science that I'm unaware of. Because mm-hmm. growing up, you always take your animal to the vet. You go to the doctor, right? You go to the dentist. So those are the very science career-based options that you know of, right? Mm-hmm. But when you realize that you can work in a lab, you can do research, you can try to uncover different things about viruses that are previously unknown, that's really exciting. And so that aspect of it and reading about how the researchers adapted to it piqued my interest for that new type of science to me and compared to the traditional pathways that you're more familiar with. So then the aspect of of teaching also, obviously a a professor here, um, was that something that was always there for you that you wanted to to teach this as well or or where, where did your love with also teaching this subject come into play? So originally it wasn't there, to Mm -hmm. be honest. I, once from high school, I went to undergrad, I went to Millersville, one of the sister schools. And from there, I went right into my PhD program at Drexel University College of Medicine. And they have a really big micro, microbiology and immunology program, which I was part of. And part of the research side of it that you have to do, or part of the other aspects of it, in addition to just the research and the academics, my research advisor really encouraged me to do some teaching. And so that's where the teaching piece came in. I think I was about, I wanna say my third year in graduate school out of a five year program that I realized, hey, I really like the teaching side of it also. So here at Mansfield, you're also able to do research here and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later, but because we're on this topic, is it, how hard is it or is it difficult to find that balance between uh, teaching it and wanting to do the research and and finding that that median of of both of those things uh yeah it's absolutely challenging and to be honest i haven't found that balance yet but hopefully i'm i'm working towards that direction and it really depends on what's going on that week what's going on that semester as well as what students i have that are interested and willing and capable to doing the different types of research projects. Right now I have uh, four Rockstar Research students that are in my lab, and so a lot of my focus is on the research side of it, but they also are able to work really independently. So it does balance a little bit better in that aspect. But yeah, there are some semesters where you just have to hit the pause on the research and really focus mm-hmm. on the teaching, and then some other semesters you can have a little bit more time to play around with the research side of it. And having, like you said, rock star students, I'm sure that makes things a lot easier in the lab. 
It does for sure, especially with some of my work study students. I give them a list and like, these are the things that need to be done and they run the assays and they come back and hand the data and we sit down together to chat about it. So they're really good. I'm really fortunate right now with my batch of students that I have. Uh, and two of your students have actually been selected for uh, some spectacular actually awards. They, you said not the first Mansfield students to get this NASA uh, scholarship, but what is the, the process of that and how do you identify one of your kids to say, they're really good, they could go for this? Yeah, so the first time we had a student apply was with Adriana Vasquez and that was back, I wanna say that she applied in the spring of 2018. I started in fall of 2016, so it was my second spring here mm -hmm. that I had her apply. And I had another student apply at the time. She was the only one that was granted the scholarship. But really what it comes down to is, are they interested in research? And are they willing to put the effort in and go that extra distance? And so for the biology program, I don't know if you know this, but all bio majors are required to do an independent research project. Okay. And so part of their uh, research method course, which they traditionally take during the fall semester of their junior year, they have to write proposals. And so students will f seek out a faculty member that they want to work with, and then they can write these proposals. And so based on the quality and the strength of the proposal, then I, it makes it easier for me to determine which students should apply for this type of scholarship. I, I want to go back to that really quickly. That, that, so the students are, are writing up their proposal. It's got to be a, a humbling feeling, too, when students write your name. You're the person they want to to work with. How's that experience like whenever you're reading those proposals? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the process during research methods is they, we each come in, each one of the faculty come in and we say a little blurb about what they could potentially research in our labs. Mm -hmm. And so anybody who's really interested in the cellular molecular side of things typically gravitate towards my lab because we have not only the cancer stuff that I'm sure we'll talk more about, I have different wound healing projects that stem from my graduate work and other types of animal model projects. Mm -hmm. And so there's quite, there's quite a lot of opportunity there. But yeah, we sit down, they come in, we chat about their interests, we determine how that could be constructed into a project, and then they go out into the literature and they read through primary literature and try to find a hole in the knowledge of, of that particular topic. So for example, I have one student who's looking at wound healing and is interested in specifically how lactic acid can influence wound healing. It's been shown in vivo, but it hasn't actually been shown in vitro, so just at the cellular level. Mm -hmm. And so she found that hole and is working to address that question. So it is a lot of back and forth at the beginning, and then they work really closely, students work really closely with faculty to really develop those proposals. So going into to you, now before we get into, again, the, the, the big meat and potatoes of what we're talking about, you've been able to be a, a part of, of peer-reviewed articles, and I've always been curious on, on really the steps to that, and how do you, who do you get in contact for that, and how do you get in contact for that, and, and what is the process to get your research peer-reviewed and an article published? So everything that we do in my side of the sciences has to be peer reviewed. You don't really go through that peer review process and have something published. So for example, if I'm in the middle of submitting a paper right now uh, with one of my collaborators at the University of Pennsylvania, and essentially what we do is we come together, we put the data together, we write the paper, and then we take a list of journals, potential journals that we could submit it to, to try to figure out where it fits best. Mm -hmm. And so each one of these journals will be a little bit unique. So for example, uh, one that we're looking at right now, we think it might fit in a journal called uh, Science Translational Medicine. And so then we format everything for that particular journal, and because each journal has their own formatting requirements, limits on figures, word count, you name it, right? And then you submit it for review, and the first step of that, the editor will look at that, and sometimes they'll just say, nope and send it right back and say, no, thank you. And then you have to shop around to a different journal. Mm -hmm. If the editor says, okay, this might work, they then send it out to usually at least three different reviewers that are experts in that related field. And each one of those reviewers does a thorough evaluation of the paper. <laughs> they pick it apart. I remember 
uh, one of my more recent papers, it went to three different reviewers and they came back with a total of, I don't know, 38 comments that they wanted us to fix or wow. change or experiments to do just for that one paper, right? So they, they really go through it and figure out, okay, did you miss a control on this experiment? Did you think about doing this experiment? What about this conclusion based on these data, right? And so they really uh, pick it apart to figure out what is needed to make it a solid paper. So then they send that back to you and you usually have six to eight weeks to do all of what they're asking you to do, which is crazy, right? It's cram time. And then once you do that, you send it back to the editor. The editor will say, okay, did they actually revise it? And if so, then it goes back out to those original reviewers and they are either satisfied or not. Mm -hmm. And if not, that could continue. Oh. <laughs> um, the longest, one time I had a paper in peer review for about a year and a half. Wow. It kept bouncing back and forth and, until we decided to pull it and publish it somewhere else and then it went right into the next journal. In general, in science, they're trying to work on that process to try to shorten it, but yeah, it can be a really long process and it's exhausting sometimes. <laughs> wow, I, I couldn't imagine. It, it's gotta be stressful though, too, to, to first of all, hear back and, and hope nothing, nothing went wrong. Is it also challenging to, with, with the styles you said, with each journal having a different style to write things that I mean, I know me personally, and, and I'm sure you do, you have a personal style of writing things out that you are always used to. Is that hard to word things in a different way? Yeah, it can be really challenging, especially to make it fit their word count or make it fit their limitations on figures. So some journals will only let you have seven figures. Some will let you have only four, and then you can put it into supplemental. So then you really have to go through it and figure out what is the most important part that needs to be in here? And that's hard because your mm -hmm. story can evolve so many times. Uh, it reminds me of my postdoc advisor at Penn. I hear his voice saying, what's your story? What's your story? And that first figure really has to set up your story. Mm -hmm. But if I'm allowed to have seven figures, that story is very different than if I'm only allowed to have four, mm -hmm. right? And so, yeah, it's always evolving and it's a really big challenge to try to make it fit. And then as far as the in-text citations, all of that style is different too. Mm. So then you have to uh, worry about how you have your references listed and everything like that. So it can be challenging. And, and I'm sure too, like, as you were saying, you want to paint this story of what you're seeing. And this might be a no brainer question <laughs> and I don't, uh, but having, having the multiple figures, do you find the more figures you're allowed in, in a, in a written, the better story you can tell, uh, or is it, or does it depend on what you're writing about? Yeah, it really depends on your study. If if you have, so for example, when my big paper that I published during my postdoc time, it was my story and another postdoc story, and we ended up merging them. And we have, I don't know, 30 supplemental figures that are included because we took two stories and made it into one. Mm -hmm. but. It was a much more thorough story, and we only really included the most important, most relevant pieces of it in the main text, and then we had, obviously, a ton of supporting material and the mm -hmm. supplemental aspect of it. So it really depends on well, what story you're trying to tell and how much work you have that goes with it. But sometimes too much data can be really challenging, too, <laughs> because then you can get distracted trying to figure out how you can weave everything in there. Yeah, again, continuing the, the balance thing, trying to find that perfect balance of what to put in there. Yep. So let's now talk about here at Mansfield, your research focus on, on tumor fibrosis. Uh, why, why specifically that here? Okay, so I, I focus on pancreatic cancer, and what's mm -hmm. unique about pancreatic cancer is that it naturally creates this fibrotic barrier around it. And so that's based on that fibrosis. And it's believed that as a result, the tumor almost protects itself from either therapies or even the immune system so that it can survive. So for example, chemotherapy, which is usually effective against other types of cancer, it can't actually diffuse or can't actually penetrate into the tumor because it has this thick wall. And so if we can figure out how we can break that wall, break that barrier down, then you can potentially increase the delivery of different types of therapeutics 
to the tumor microenvironment. And so that, that wall of tissue can be a really big issue, a really big hurdle when it comes to treatment efficacy. And so we're trying to work on that from the mm -hmm. standpoint of how can we actually then program cells in our own body to break down that physical barrier so that we can have more effective treatment delivery. And so with, with pancreatic cancer uh, and, and with your specific pick, was this something, was this type of cancer something you, you looked at and said, hey, this is what I want to tackle? Or, or was there something like in your life that made you want to tackle pancreatic cancer? Or, or why specifically that focus? So that really came when I started with my postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania. When I finished my PhD at Drexel Med, I was working on an autoimmune disorder called systemic sclerosis or scleroderma, which is another fibrotic disorder that can cause hardening and fibrosis of the skin and also internal organs. Mm -hmm. And that's a relatively rare disease. And I wanted to work on something that was a little bit more prevalent. And as I was transitioning to my postdoc, my postdoc advisor was brand new, just starting his lab at Penn, and he's a big macrophage guy, which is a type of immune cell, and he needed a person that understood fibrosis to join his lab. So it actually worked out really well based on my background. I was always interested in cancer just because of the fact that you can't live your life without being touched either directly or indirectly mm -hmm. by cancer, right? And so I always had that interest. And specifically with pancreatic cancer, it is one of the most lethal cancers, right? The overall survival rate of pancreatic cancer for one year is only 25% after diagnosis. And it drops to about 8% of the five year overall survival after diagnosis. So it's extremely deadly, even though it's uh, rather rare in terms of diagnosis. And so that is extra motivation, right? Another motivating factor to really devote yourself to something because it's a terrible diagnosis to get. And mm -hmm. so if you can help alleviate that or help trying to increase the quality of life or extend life, then that's something that's extremely motivating. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't imagine too, with this, you said it tries to protect itself uh, too it, with pancreatic cancer. I, I wanna ask in the lab, uh, specifically when working on what so what exactly is is a, st a student or someone ready to research in the lab what exactly are they looking at in steps to to really help you out in the lab research wise so it really depends on the interests of the student mm -hmm. and where they want to take the project so we can be doing the in vitro side of it in vitro means outside of the body where we take tumor cells that were derived from pancreas tumors of mice, we can grow those in culture. And so we have an incubator and we have these different types of uh, tissue culture vessels that we grow our cells and you can directly treat them with novel therapies if you wanted to. You can learn about growth rates, you can learn about uh, what types of proteins they're essentially making, all at the in vitro outside of the body level. But we can also take those same tumor cells and implant them or inject them into mice because we do have a mouse colony here and it's the same genetic background mm -hmm. as our tumor cells so that the mice won't just automatically reject them uh, when you implant them. And so we can actually create what's referred to as subcutaneous tumors where you just put it underneath the skin and they can grow up into a solid tumor. So essentially they're growing uh, tumors that are derived from these pancreatic cancer tumor cells under the skin. And then if something works really well as an anti-cancer treatment in vitro, then we can put it in vivo, so back into a living animal to see how that influences or how that therapy works in the setting of having uh, multiple factors in there, right? Because you now have blood supply, so it could be influencing angiogenesis or the development of blood vessels you have immune cells in there right so mm -hmm. it's much more complicated when it goes back into the mouse and so if you find something that works both in vivo or in addition to in vitro if it works in vivo also then you're really on to something so a lot of my students started that in vitro side of it and then ultimately progressed to the mouse model or if i have a student who's interested in uh, potential resistance to therapy and that can all be done in vitro because she thinks that 
the compound is actually selecting for more aggressive tumors. So that can really stay on the in vitro side of it. So it really depends on the project, whether or not it goes from the in vitro, just tumor cell side, to the in vivo, now we're growing tumors in a mouse side of it. It, what has been the most surprising uh, breakthrough, I guess is the best way to put it, that you have seen in, in your time here at Mansfield uh, out, of, out of one of these student ideas that, that really has surprised you? So the project that Caitlin Bodie is working on right now was started by Adriana Vasquez back in 2018. And essentially, that project was based on ideas that were presented in, across multiple courses that she had. Mm -hmm. So she had just taken immunology, so learning about how the immune system can play a role in this. She had taken tissue culture, which is where you learn all of these techniques to grow the tumor cells in vitro. Mm -hmm. And also cancer awareness, in which we talk about different types of novel therapies, and came to the observation that one of these compounds called curcumin, which is a plant-based compound, which is now the go-to type of compound that they're looking at because it has less off-target effects, less adverse okay. effects. Uh, they found that this is actually making it into some phase two clinical trials for other solid types of tumors, but the preclinical side of it, so before it goes into people, was only ever tested in mice that had artificial immune systems, essentially. And so then she questioned whether or not it would work in a mouse that has a tumor with a natural immune system. Mm -hmm. And we found out that it doesn't. And now with Caitlin, we're trying to figure out why, right? Okay. Uh, why does it work in a mouse model that has an artificial immune system? So what part of our natural immune system or the mouse's natural immune system is inhibiting this therapy and keeping it from working. And that's a really important piece because as mm -hmm. I mentioned, this therapy is in phase two clinical trials. And so if we can figure out what is impeding its effectiveness, then we might be able to make it more effective in people. And so that was a, a really surprising project because it went on to grow into inclu include a collaboration at the University of Pennsylvania and also with a private pharmaceutical company. And so it, it really grew in that aspect. Wow, that's incredible, actually. Uh, and how does it feel to not to, uh, let's see, how do I want to really word this is to be able to do that type of research here at Mansfield University where where we make do with with what we have in terms of of equipment i'm sure you, there's always some stuff that you want more but to be able to do this kind of research here uh how much does that help uh or or rather what can you take away from that the fact that you're able to to do this despite some of the obstacles that there may be great right, absolutely and to be transparent, I was spoiled when I came here. <laughs> I left the University of Pennsylvania, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. a brand new lab that was just set up that had a ridiculous amount of equipment. And I joke, but my postdoc advisor replaced me with a machine that essentially did the work <laughs> that I did from the immunohistochemistry, from the, t the tissue uh, staining side of it. So he literally replaced me with a machine. And we just had all of these really awesome types of assays and things that were available at our fingertips and so coming to Mansfield it is a primarily undergraduate institution mm -hmm. right so you don't have all of those uh, different types of fancy equipment that you would find at one of those R1 granting institutions like the University of Pennsylvania or Drexel College of Medicine mm -hmm. and you definitely have to scale back your assays and you have to get a little bit more creative with trying to determine how you can answer your questions without being able to use the fancy equipment, right? But we still have a lot of uh, really solid equipment. We do a lot of RNA expression assays, which RNA is that intermediate between what's coded in the cell and what proteins are trying to make, right? Mm -hmm. So we have uh, different types of equipment that will allow us to do that type of assay. We can measure and quantify proteins if we wanted to. We can obviously grow cells in vitro, and that requires a lot of equipment from that side of it. So we do have 
a lot of solid equipment that is absolutely required for me to do anything that I do. But aside from that, I rely heavily on collaborators mm -hmm. for the pieces of equipment that I don't have. So for example, um, going back to Adriana, she was looking at, she depleted a particular immune cell and had to verify that the depletion worked. So we took a whole bunch of blood samples, stained them, and then she and another student drove four hours to the University of Pennsylvania <laughs> and dropped off the sample so that they could run it on wow. the flow cytometer, right? So it does create, you do have to get creative in mm -hmm. that aspect, but I think it's so important for our students to see that they can do research at this mm -hmm. level and we can still get really amazing projects from the equipment that we do have. We have a cryostat so we can do tissue sectioning and staining. We have a microscope that we can do immunofluorescence with the help of Dr. Farkas. We wouldn't be able to do anything fluorescent related <laughs> without, without her. But we do have those types of assays and equipment available to us. So as long as we plan ahead to mm -hmm. address those questions, we've been able to do it. And it's really great to allow students to have that hands-on type of experience. And you can really just see their passion grow as they start to do their own stuff, start to figure out how this equipment works. And so that's definitely exciting. And I think you would miss a little bit of that if you just had fancy machines doing everything for you. Is that one of the most rewarding parts, too, for you as a, a researcher and a, and a teacher to see that passion grow in your students? Yeah, absolutely, especially if I have a student that comes in and knows that they like science but have no idea what they want to do or, or where they want to go with their degree. And a lot of them, too, as I'm sure you know, we have a lot of first-generation students, so they really don't even know what's out there in the world for them. Mm -hmm. So to help show those individuals what they're capable of and then also what the opportunities are is really awesome and absolutely that's the reason that I get up every day. Hey it's a, it's a great reason to, to be, be able. I want to go back to the creativity aspect of it and, and do you find that actually having to find creative solutions actually makes the science better? If that makes sense <laughs> as a reasonable question. <laughs> I think it makes the understanding of the science better for the students if they if it has to be a more creative approach to answering a question mm -hmm. they have to understand what they're doing a little bit better and they have to understand the science behind it better but in terms of is it better at generating results I wouldn't say yes or no mm -hmm. as long as you know you get results that are nice and consistent um, but it's definitely a longer process and it's, it has a steeper learning curve, but that's really good for the students too. They'll, they might get frustrated, they might fail a couple times, but they learn to stick with it. Mm -hmm. And that makes it so much more rewarding at the end of the day when you actually get your assay to work and you get an answer to your hypothesis. And I, I'm sure at times, especially dealing with uh, any form really of cancer, it can get frustrating at times for the students and for yourself, I'm sure. Uh, what are the things that you try to do to when things are are going off, or, or I don't want to say going wrong because I try to avoid that, but going off that you have to, to say to your students uh, as the teacher to, to, hey, there's a silver lining here. Where is that balance and how do you find those words for for frustration on this topic yeah that's definitely tough right <laughs> and for me a lot of my research students will talk about how they should do an assay i'll show them how to do an assay but then i let them do it themselves mm -hmm. and sometimes something will go wrong and i really let them try to figure out where it went wrong because they're going to learn from that versus me just going in and, and telling mm -hmm. them what went wrong and so that can be really frustrating for them, but once they figure it out, it reinforces what they need to do and how to do it. So I, I find that that's helpful, but from the frustrating side of it, if they can't figure it out, we'll sit down, we'll have a powwow, and mm -hmm. we'll talk about, again, from the science side of it, what could have gone wrong, how could we fix it? And if it's an approach that just isn't working, which happens all the time, mm -hmm. then we try to determine another approach to go at it. But I remind them that as much as you don't want to talk about things going wrong or failing, mm -hmm. 
there's a lot of failure in science, right? So not only are we talking about your hypotheses being wrong, but Western blobs that just won't work, right? And that's a, a way of measuring protein expression. From my graduate work, I was given the task of trying to isolate collagen, which is a huge protein that is very strong, mm -hmm. and trying to isolate it from skin, and then put that in an assay that we could essentially quantify the amount of protein that's there. And I would grind skin samples by hand for 45 minutes, and oh, it was daunting, it was tedious, and at the end of the day, it just didn't always work, right? And so then we determined, okay, fine, if we don't wanna go about it from this approach, what other assay can we do? So I remind them that as a scientist, I've lived this, right? Mm -hmm. I, I know what it's like to spend you know, a year trying to get an assay to work and it just might not work. It took me a year and a half to perfect one of my RNA isolation assays, an entire year and a half of things wow. going wrong, right? And so I remind them of what my experiences are and I think it gives them a little bit of confidence knowing that they're not alone and this is part of the scientific process. But yeah, it's frustrating, it's challenging for sure. And some of the students just get to the point where it's the second semester of their senior year and we just sit down and say, we don't have to keep collecting data. You have enough for your project mm -hmm. that's required for this research portion of the biology degree. So if, if you wanna focus on other things, we don't have to continue, right? Mm -hmm. So if we, I, I never let a student boil over in that yeah. aspect. I, I, this probably should have been one of the first uh, things I asked, but to, because uh, that that made me think. So, what is your I, the ideal, I guess, personality type of a, a of a scientist, or is there? Because <laughs> you got to have a little bit of creativity, a little bit of level headedness. It's it's a jumbled bag, I guess. But what do you think, in, in your professional opinion, <laughs> what the ideal personality? Uh, of a scientist in, in this field specifically should be? Yeah, I don't know. I've never actually been asked that question. You definitely need to have thick skin, right? Mm -hmm. That's one thing. You need to be able to persevere. You can't give up easily. And there there's definitely a, a mix of personality that you also have to be a team player, especially in my lab. My students work together with a lot of stuff so if a student can't come in to do a time point they rely on the other research students in my lab to do that and so if you're not a team player right away that's not going to work mm -hmm. in my lab um, you have to be rather independent and self-motivated if you have to take cell counts at various times I can't be having to send you an email on a Saturday begging you to go in and do your cell counts, right? Mm -hmm. So it does require that own self-motivation and they have to really want it, right? Mm -hmm. That it has, they have to have that passion or else they won't be self-motivated to come in. And likewise, usually if students share that common passion, that common interest, then they're really willing to work together as team players. And so I think those are some of the major features that they need to have. Yeah, I think it's an, an understated uh, thing just truth truthfully in a lab setting the the the, um, the willingness to work with others and the willingness to to go out like like you've said not only in, in terms of peer review you need other eyes on it but to have multiple eyeballs on a project at times how truthfully probably for the for your own sanity how how helpful is that when you have multiple even differing personalities or, or differing opinions in a lab yeah it's really helpful and we have in, in my lab we have lab meetings where we'll sit down as a group and talk about where we are with our research and we do this in an effort with students that are working with dr farkas so she'll come in she'll bring her research students in and we'll sit down and we'll talk about our projects We'll air out our frustrations if something's not going right. We'll share our excitement of new data. And then you definitely get individuals with different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And so if they're not directly part of a project, they might have a different idea or they might look at data differently. And so it's absolutely helpful to have those types of outside opinions. And we started doing the joint lab meetings with Dr. Farkas last year. and my students have benefited tremendously from mm -hmm. that aspect. 
Uh, you got to love like collaboration makes all of this uh, a lot easier. I, I'm sure sure you know, but also you we've talked about it a couple of times. But collaborations with other institutions when they're when you need to do that and you need to get things checked is that an easy process or a difficult process to to really get done? It's easy once you have that collaboration. It can be challenging to get collaborations. And if anything positive came out of our quarantine, it's Zoom and Zoom meetings, right? So for example, it was either last week or the week before, uh, Caitlin and I had a meeting with our collaborator at the University of Pennsylvania where we shared our data mm -hmm. so that we could try to determine what pieces do we need to finish before we can submit, write up a manuscript and submit it for publication. And it was really helpful to be able to share screens and have his look at the data and our look because um, he's more of a T-cell guy. I'm more of a fibroblast, macrophage, uh, fibrosis type of person. So it was really helpful to actually sit down and see the data together. And previously that would have really required in-person meetings that would be rather few and far between based on the location of Penn mm -hmm. and Mansfield. But with Zoom and the ability to share screens and not have to do that OneDrive thing and look at <laughs> screens at the same time, it's really helpful. Mm -hmm. So that aspect is getting a little bit more easy, uh, but it's still always hard to try to create new collaborations because you have to essentially prove your worth to somebody else that you're worth their time mm -hmm. and potentially their money and reagents mm -hmm. right and so it has to really be a mutual type of benefit when you're going at the collaboration side of it you know you brought up a, an interesting point uh, an interesting topic that I want well obviously the world <laughs> right now is in a global uh, pandemic what uh, because obviously, I, I you know the the decontamination to get into the lab to work in the lab. In current day and age, are there any extra steps with the the COVID nineteen pandemic that you guys have to take for uh, your lab? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, previously in tissue culture, for example, because we work in a sterile environment and we grow cells that hopefully doesn't pick up contamination. Mm -hmm. My students have to wear gloves, they have to wear safety glasses, they have to wear lab coats, and so that's a pretty normal thing for them. They also always have to spray down their hands or anything that's going into our sterile hood environment with ethanol. So they always have to be cleaning things down that are going in and out of the hood, likewise what goes into our incubator. So they're used to it from that aspect. Obviously, uh, we have to limit the number of students that can be in the lab now so that they can ad abide by the six feet rule for the physical distancing. So that's different. They, they can no longer congregate with four or five students at once, right? So we have to limit that and that requires a little bit more scheduling. Mm -hmm. Obviously the um, face masks or face shields, depending on what they're doing, they have to abide by those rules. And then as far as shared materials, they used to be able to take their gloves off when they were done and then write things in their notebooks with their own pens or use their phones to do different types of calculations. We don't do that anymore. There are pens that are provided. There are calculators that are provided. So they don't touch anything outside of wearing gloves. Mm -hmm. So that's one major thing that yeah. changed and that so somebody potentially could sneeze on their hands, right? touch equipment and then somebody else would touch equipment after them and not realize it and then potentially the microscope could act as a fomite that goes out the window when everything is gloved so they're not touching anything directly with their own skin now in the lab and so it's similar to what they've had to do before except now they they aren't allowed to take their gloves off mm -hmm. and they keep spraying their hands down and they're limited to the number of students that can be in the lab at the same time all right, so not too much disruption, which is a good thing. Because of the levels that we already had, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Whew, which is good Yeah. Uh, for you. I, I want to also talk, considering we're on that topic of, of the global pandemic, too, in terms of, of specifically in a, a, again, and it's kind of what we just touched on, but in a, the lab setting, uh, and trying to find 
because of social distancing and because of less people in there and the collaboration aspect that we've talked about throughout this has have you found that to be a little more challenging lately because there's less people in the lab um or is or is that something you found that because of certain technologies and zoom and, and stuff that we've talked about that you are able to get that collaboration still available if that makes any sense yeah definitely <laughs> as far as students in the lab it's more of a scheduling pain mm -hmm. right to make sure that only this number of students will be in the lab at this period of time so if somebody else needs to do an assay uh, usually I could have molecular stuff going right next to the tissue culture stuff in the lab outside of my office now the molecular stuff I might take downstairs to a different lab and mm -hmm. so then that student will be by themselves working on that when just a tissue culture student is working in the hood. So from the scheduling side of it, yeah, it's been challenging. But with Zoom, uh, we're able to really make up for the potential issues that we would have from the collaboration aspect of mm -hmm. it in terms of data sharing and data analysis. We can still do it that way. What a, I mean, if there's a silver lining to this, I think we figured out that Zoom is a wonderful tool. <laughs> to an extent, because it does get very tiring staring at a computer screen all day, and Zoom burnout is real. Uh, actually, you know, you're, okay, you're not wrong <laughs> with, <laughs> with that. So, you specifically, your research here, what are the things you're focusing? We've talked on, on helping the students and, and what they are, but what is, what have been your main focuses this year? So I've learned too that as I've spent more time here at Mansfield that I do less and less bench work on my own mm -hmm. and I rely more heavily on my students for that. And I should have learned this lesson from my postdoc advisor because as I mentioned, he just started a, a brand new lab when I started with him. And he used to come in, I would see him in the lab all the time doing different assays and it slowly moved to him being more on the data analysis side of it and relying more on the students to generate and collect the data. And I've seen that transition. So my projects and my focus is really align more with what the student projects are and then uh, push those projects in different types of directions too if I see a need for it to try to make the project more well-rounded, for example. So I've tried to align my interests with that of what some of the students are trying to do so that I have those set of hands to help with the data collection aspect of it. Hey, I mean, when you have, have people who are competent enough and able, might as well uh, be able to work together to come up with, with something spectacular. All right, I, I wanna ask this too, like in the future, is there something you see on the horizon that you want to potentially start researching or potentially m move into that direction with research? Have you been able to, to look up, uh, off into the distance and say, this is something we would want to look at? Yeah, my, my background in research with pancreatic cancer was really on the immunotherapy side of it. So retraining your immune system to recognize and eliminate tumor cells and innately your immune system does that but eventually the tumor cells get too smart and they outsmart your immune system and then your immune system no longer recognizes that they're there which is when solid tumors can build up and one of the most exciting aspects about treatments potential treatments for pancreatic cancer lies in that immunotherapy side of it. So I would love to get back to finding different types of therapies that could work as an immunotherapy and really reprogram the immune system. It, it is challenging. A lot of it requires uh, techniques that we just can't do. Mm -hmm. But if there's some sort of uh, checkpoint blockade or other type of uh, pathway that we could potentially inhibit, then we could jump right back into the immunotherapy game. And so I'm hoping that through some of the studies that we're doing now, it might open some of those doors in the future. All right. That sounds exciting, uh, honestly. And thank you. Before we go, though, I have a couple questions that I ask everyone on the podcast. Okay. Uh, and I need to hear your thoughts on these two. The first one is what is your go-to 
Uh, meal to impress. Like if you're cooking, what is your go-to meal that you make to impress? It depends on the type of person. So for example, uh, my dad loves sausage gravy and biscuits and my mom will never cook it for him. So whenever my parents come to visit, I always make sausage gravy and biscuits. If I'm hosting a large number of people, I'll go to my pulled pork that I can crock pot for 16 hours on yeah. low and my mac and cheese. Um, my husband really likes when I make tacos and Mexican. So it depends on really who I'm right. trying to, I guess, impress. All right. That's a good answer. And then my second uh, question here is, so public speaking is a tough thing. <laughs> Uh, and everyone has that one time where in, in a public speaking moment that it has gone horribly wrong. I don't need to know the whole story, but in, in three words or phrases, what is your worst public speaking experience? And I will go first. Mine is high school game show bleach. Okay. And there will be no follow-up questions, so don't, don't worry about that aspect. Mine would probably be grad school, committee meeting, lots of sweat stains. All right. <laughs> and no follow-up question, as I said. Well, I, Kristen, thank you so much for taking the time stopping by. Uh, I feel every time I talk to someone who is, who is in a science field, they make me feel, uh, well, I mean, I, I, they make me feel dumb first of all because of how much they know but also the fact that you guys are doing extremely good work here and i'm excited for it. i'm sure you're excited for it, and thank you for your work oh absolutely and thanks for this opportunity to share some of our aspects our exciting aspects that we're doing in the lab with you all right well thank you once again and that's going to do it for us folks thank you so much for listening to another great episode of conversations have a great day